delta u is delta q plus delta w and that this is equal to delta w only because delta q is bas khamosh shuru ho gayi class delta because delta q is zero by design and hence this is equal to delta w1 plus delta w2 and then things follow the way they do so the 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 the, the mistake i was making was in trying to put an integral sign onto it which obviously was not the right way um uh, apart from this correction in my uh, lecture today i have the following agenda i would uh, make another explanation on uh, uh we go back actually to um a few questions on the third law of thermodynamics and these questions will be um first question uh in the describing the third law of thermodynamics i said uh, entropy goes down to a minimum value and uh, as temperature goes down to the absolute zero of temperature and i said that we normally take that value of entropy at 0 degree kelvin to be the zero of entropy all right but i think i need we need to spend a little time on that part also because uh, there are a few things that we must keep in mind in making this assumption number 1 entropy is a kind of thing which is uh, um is a kind of thing which does not have any absolute value absolute value which means that there isn't any well defined lower value from which you could find the value some other at some other point and um, this uh, is more like the mechanical potential potential energy function that we use like <coughs> the potential energy function that we use in mechanics <coughs> which is again something not um given at a particular point there has to be it is measured from a reference point so if we need to calculate say for example the potential energy of an object in terms of mgh mass times g times uh, the height and that height is something which can be measured in um, a relative term you can measure it from here from this floor you can measure it from the uh, bottom of the building or you can measure it from uh, the sea level or you can measure it from the center of the earth um but this is all relative and uh, um <clears throat> measured from a <clears throat> reference point there is no um zero of it from which you put measure potential energy in the same way entropy doesn't have any absolute value then what happens at uh, um uh zero kelvin <clears throat> at zero kelvin um things are completely quiet no motion assumed that there is will be absolutely no motion and there is no um 
reason for there to be any contribution to entropy. But then there actually are various other contri various contributions to entropy, even at uh, uh, what about at um, even at zero Kelvin, absolute zero, absolute zero, about which we have the third law is very specific in saying. <coughs> that you cannot actually achieve zero degree Kelvin. You can get close to it, but cannot achieve it. So what about entropy at this level? There are several contributions that remain. And these several contributions point out that actually entropy is not equal to zero. What are those contributions? Um, there is something called um, <clears throat> um, Heisenberg uncertainty uh, principle. Which is uncertainty in the position and momentum um, uh, of uh, the particle. You all uh, know that, that they say that the spread in the values of um, <clears throat> position and momenta, the product of these is greater than or equal to H. There is a small amount which remains, there is a small amount which remains in defining the position and uh, momentum with the utmost accuracy at the quantum level. And this uh, inaccuracy, this uncertainty, gives rise to a, a, um, uh, an entropy of the system. State of a system is given in terms of position and momentum. If you define for a particular particle um, its position, its momentum at a given point in time, you have defined the state of the particle completely. Okay? Because of this uncertainty, you can't define the state so certain with so with such certainty. And that uncertainty goes into uh, contributing to uh, entropy. Uh, number one. And this actually manifests itself in what is called the zero point motion. You remember, or you will, uh, you must have come across the zero point oscillations. Uh, if you have an oscillator, um, then the natural frequency of the oscillator is h bar omega, and um, uh, uh, n plus half is the energy of an oscillator depending upon what n is. But this half h bar omega is even the lowest value of energy has this half h power omega, which means um, <clears throat> the energy, even in the lowest quantum state, is not equal to zero. It is half h power omega. And that is uh, something which, again, contributes to the, um, uh, the, to the, to the, to, to, en to the entropy. <laughs> and the second point is that mostly, one would have situations where the substances would have um, some isotopic con uh, composition. And when substances have isotopic com composition, the two substances will have um, only very slightly ma different mass, but then they would be completely identical chemically and everything. Yeah, you have a question? I'm sorry? Oh, this is a quantum number. It tells you which state, so you have a state, quantum states, which are all quantized. Have you already had courses in quantum mechanics? Huh? Modern physics. So modern physics did talk about this, right? If you're talking about the end, the start from 
Uh, all right. So, so, so the point is that then um, the lowest value is the uh, value which is not equal to zero. It is equal to half h bar omega, and the next value is three half h bar omega. Does that answer your question, or you still have the? Uh, Okay, you, 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 um, uh, the, the, you see, the, this is why they say that the energy level is, and it starts from one, okay? But below n equal to one is the utmost lowest energy state, which is half h bar omega. Call it n equal to zero, okay? Utmost lowest energy state. Um, okay, uh, the, this, the point that I was trying to make was, okay, there will be these isotopic compositions, so there will be atoms which will be different from each other in terms of isotopic composition, uh, but they would be chemically completely identical, and hence um, uh, there will be an entropy of mixing associated with these distinguishable particles. So these uh, uh, isotopic com isotopes will be uh, isotopes will be distinguishable and therefore they will lead to uh, the entropy of mixing. there are all these problems because of which um, you can't say that you actually can have entropy equal to zero at the absolute temperature T equal to zero Kelvin. You cannot say that. Okay? However, in doing the calculation, and today my focus is going to be on uh, the use of thermodynamics in chemistry. Um, entropy change um, would be, um, there would not be any absolute value, but then s some reference entropy value. Um, S value can be uh, put equal to zero, like we do in the case of potential energy function. Let me take, you know, the potential energy at this, at the floor is equal to zero, and we can measure it from the floor. So there's, that can be put equal to zero, and one can then measure entropies from there. In that sense, chemists um, consider absolute entropy and absolute entropy is in fact I will put this plural to show that they calculate entropies of each of each sub substance and I will tell you today how they calculate all of these uh, absolute entropies for different substances and what do they do with them? How do they use them in chemical reactions? Okay? That will be uh, something which will tell us how this concept is used in different places. So the substance will have more than, there, there will be, suppose we take carbon. And then maybe a lump of carbon that we take and try and look into, uh, the chemistry of it, or physics of it, would have uh, in them various uh, isotopes of carbon. And uh, those isotopes of carbon would uh, therefore distinct, will make uh, distinguishable particles. And because they are mixed in a certain, ma certain manner, therefore entropy of mixing will exist in that substance. 
Okay? Entropy will not be equal to zero. Alright? Um, this was uh, um, one statement from so entropy changes and the third and another point is entropy during phase change. Uh, I will come to that in a minute. I think I will have something separate to uh, tell you about entropy of phase change. Yes, we will talk of that. One other thing that I need, I wanted to add from the to the last lecture. This was about, you know, entropy and what do we expect and uh, how the third law of thermodynamics deals with it. I would now come go to the um, the point that I was raising last time, towards the end of my last lecture, adiabatic demagnetization. And the idea was very simple, straightforward, and you saw how uh, isothermal magnetization and adiabatic demagnetization could reduce um, uh, the, the, the temperature. In fact, the way the curves are, curve was drawn was auto, uh, automatically suggested. I had temperature on this side, and I had entropy on this side, and I had uh, two curves arbitrarily taken. I have absolutely no uh, uh, reason to draw it in this particular form, just arbitrarily chosen. And the other one is perhaps this. And um, the, it follows one uh, statement of the third law of thermodynamics that they go to zero, whatever is that zero, number one. Number two, for, you know, this is what Kelvin, not Kelvin, sorry. Um, um, no, I think, I think this was Debye. Debye said that for a pure crystalline substance, um, the, the entropy would be zero. Anyway, uh, number one, the entropy is go to zero. And number two, the change in entropy is nearly becoming equal at towards the end, becoming zero in fact, because the curves are flattening out. Change in entropy is becoming zero, the slope is becoming zero, and they all go to the same value. This is what basically comes out in various statements of the third law of thermodynamics. So if you choose to read the third law of thermodynamics in uh, X number of books, you will find them, find it stated in different ways. And um, now here, um, one of the statements is that in no finite number of processes can you achieve zero degree Kelvin. And uh, as I said over here, that if you were trying to do this adiabatic demagnetization and cooling the substance, and you thought you would get to get to um, zero, you would notice already that when I am about over here, the number amount, the 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 uh, redu reduction in temperature is becoming smaller and smaller, and uh, it is quite clear that when I am in this regime, it will take me infinite number of steps to get to zero Kelvin because they are they are just there. Uh, you know, two, two, the two curves meet each other. They are two. They are they are coincident. Yes, सवाल कहाँ से कहाँ से sorry ये आपका सवाल क्या है? Ah, okay. The upper curve is uh, um, this is adiabatic demagnetization. So this is the demagnetized paramagnet. Paramagnetic salt, paramagnet, and this is uh, uh, magnetized paramagnet. Magnetized paramagnet means paramagnet put in magnetic field. Uh, sir, Your question. In this system, uh, we have two steps. One is the isothermal magnetization, and then there is an adiabatic uh, demagnetization. Demagnetization. So, what about the second step? How do they physically achieve it? Because how would you keep the entropy constant and still decrease the temperature of the magnet? You uh, insulate the system completely and take out the uh, 
um, magnetic field. When you see a paramagnet is a substance in which all the magnetic moments are completely randomly oriented. Atomic, at the atomic level, each atom has a magnetic moment. So in a paramagnet, there would be, uh, if this is the paramagnet, the uh, substance, then there are these atomic magnetic moments pointing in all possible directions, um, etc., etc. And uh, when you apply magnetic field to it, they will all, to, in order to reduce their energy, they will align themselves with the magnetic field. So, uh, when you apply magnetic field to it, uh, then they will all align themselves. So, this is what happens actually in the case of uh, an electromagnet. An electromagnet is actually a paramagnet. And then, with the help of this coil, you create a magnetic field, and that aligns all the uh, individual atomic <laughs> magnetic moments along the field. Uh, sir, but in the second step, we are keeping the entropy constant, which means that the order of those magnets remains the constant, and you are not taking any heat out of the system, and still you are decreasing the temperature. No, no. You are not decreasing the temperature. You are actually okay. You are, you are, you are, you are only keeping. Yes. The what you what you do is that you let the system go back into the unmagnetized state by taking the magnetic field away, and you do this in an environment where you don't let any field, any 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 heat go out of the system. All right, and uh, then. You will notice that when you do, do this, these, the, the particles will realign themselves, and they, they, they will, they will when, they, uh, they, when they again become completely random, they actually take away that heat, which had already, um, you know, and that reduces the temperature. In the process of going from here to here, takes away that heat. And that is, in the, on, on this picture, this is what is sort of comes out very clearly. Uh, what I did not show you actually was, uh, perhaps um, I can uh, circulate this to you, a proper four cycle, four step cycle in adiabatic demagnetization in the same way as you see in other engines or refrigeration cycle that I described yesterday. The four steps through which you take the system. But this is a schematic uh, a, a, a representation of the same phenomenon. All right? And uh, then perhaps you will understand it better. I'm sorry? Sure, 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 sure. This is the most common way of, uh, his question was, does adiabatic demagnetization and cooling by adiabatic demagnetization exist? Yes, this is the most common uh, cooling method nowadays. You see, evaporation, uh, by simple evaporation, uh, by using the um, latent heat of um, uh, evaporation, is the crudest way of reducing temperature. So when you sit under your uh, uh, under a fan, you are essentially cooling yourself by evaporation. And then are the other methods that I described yesterday: joule thomson effect, for example, throttling process, and other things. This particular method is very um, advanced in the sense that it can take you to uh, milli kelvin, ten to the power minus three kelvin. 10 to the power minus 3 Kelvin, less than 1 Kelvin. With the other method, Joule Kelvin method, you can actually, uh, Joule Thomson method, you can go down to maybe about uh, 70, 50 Kelvin, 30 Kelvin, not below that. You wouldn't be able to even, maybe you can, you can actually no, can go down to about 4 Kelvin, 3 Kelvin, 4 Kelvin, because that was the way used to uh, liquefy helium. 
and uh, once you liquefy helium then you can so 70 kelvin is where 77 kelvin is when you liquefy um, nitrogen and liquid nitrogen is a very, very common substance for uh, uh, doing experiments at low temperatures liquid helium is at 4.6 kelvin you go down to that level but then this with this you can go down to millikelvin and i was going to say then uh, that in the nuclear demagnetization which was the last point I made in my last lecture, you can actually go down to a millionth of a, less than a millionth of a, of uh, a Kelvin. Okay? And why is that? This is because in the case of magnetization, when magnetic field acts on a substance, the individual magnet, individual atoms have a magnetic moment measured in um, what is called a Bohr magneton. A Bohr magneton is uh, um, if you, you must have come across this thing, uh, usually written as mu B Bohr magneton is uh, defined as E H bar over M C. M is electron mass. Okay, and um, this is this is Bohr magneton, and the value of this Bohr magneton is about. Uh, 5 times 10 to the power minus 2 I will let me check I shouldn't um, oh it is here 5 times 10 to the power minus 27 <clears throat> oh sorry uh, this Bohr magneton is Bohr magneton is 9 times 10 to the power minus 24 joule per this T is not temperature this is Tesla Tesla is the unit of magnetic field per unit per this unit of magnetic field you have this energy uh, so many joules uh, nuclear magneton which is a result of actually aligning you know these um, uh, nuclear nucleons nuclear particles protons and neutrons have their own have magnetic moment on them also and this magnetic moment is uh, in the units of nuclear magneton which is uh, usually written as this and it is uh, E h bar over m n times c mass of a nucleon of a proton or a neutron okay and uh, mass of a neutron or a proton is about uh, a thousand times smaller than the mass of an um, or is, 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 uh, is larger than a um, uh, 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 mass of an electron so this actually is about five times two thousand times eighteen hundred and something sometimes so it's ten to the power minus twenty seven joule per tesla so it is very small and because this is very small uh, when you try and align nucleons in a magnetic field you need to actually apply a very large amount of magnetic field and when you apply a very large amount of magnetic field it actually you know the, the curve uh, for um, nuclear demagnetization nuclear demagnetization would be something like this uh, at the lower end it may have a you know for for a magnetized state for a demagnetized state it may actually be something like this so that when you uh, come down it might sort of go down pretty rapidly 
and go down to very, very low temperatures very rapidly. Uh, this is very schematic. You will perhaps, if you search for them, you will see uh, a little more credible looking pictures. But this is uh, how de a nuclear demagnetization can get you down to very, very low temperatures quite rapidly. And that is a very standard way, but, but provided you can uh, 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 manage to have very high magnetic fields that can give rise to this magnetization. All right, so that was uh, adding to some of my points, earlier points, and now I can go to chemical thermodynamics. Can we actually achieve efficiency greater than what Carnot defined as the highest efficiency? No, but you don't measure your efficiency. You, this is this is not. Uh, I mean, the, I don't know. The, his question is, uh, for such uh, magnetic cooling mechanisms, can one uh, achieve efficiencies uh, higher than the efficiency of a Carnot engine? So I think what he has in mind is perhaps a question uh, of Carnot engine being reversed, this is the heat engine, being reversed to act as a uh, cooling engine, as a refrigerator, and therefore has a, uh, which factor, performance factor? Uh, coefficient, of coefficient of performance. Coefficient of performance, and is this coefficient of performance better than that coefficient of performance, okay? And coefficient of performance is, uh, Likewise, the, the, the way it is defined in the case of um, Carnot engine, the efficiency of Carnot engine and coefficient of performance are inverse of each other. Okay? Now, um, for these, uh, um, I have not seen anybody actually calculating the coefficient of performance for them. Uh, I have also not checked that out, but maybe maybe you can take it up as a uh, reading assignment and try and see if people have actually worked out uh, some ways to determine coefficient of performance for this refrigeration system. Okay. <clears throat> I would then now I'm uh, now making a transition to a new topic and uh, this would be trying to do chemical thermodynamics so those of you who are doing chemistry would be very happy and uh, people like me who don't look like chemistry always feel very unhappy about it, but then, uh, you know, many of the things that we do in physics are, for the matter of principle, what chemists actually do is actually get down to making use of each and everything. And therefore, they get down to all the numbers and everything, and therefore, in today's lecture, you expect to see uh, so many numbers coming in. Um, how are entropies measured? <clears throat> uh, um, for different species. Basically, the uh, entropy is uh, obtained from the relationship <clears throat> uh, the definition of the heat capacity. Heat capacity is this, with X being either V or P, and usually chemical reactions take place um, under um, constant pressure normally. Therefore, it is actually Cp that enters into this X equal to P. And um, from there, you immediately say that ds is equal to 
Cp over T times dt. Okay? <clears throat> From this expression, you immediately say that this divided by T and then ds over dt, you just um, take out ds and dt to the two sides. And then you say that delta S change in entropy, which is what you can talk about, is integral of this from point some initial value to some final value. <coughs> and the initial value could be something which you could be you which you could uh, write as the S zero, the zero, the reference point of the entropy. The ref reference point of entropy. So this integral is taken to be S in the final state, which is S at a given temperature minus S0. And this therefore is equal to um, the Cp over T dt. And this integral is from initial to final state and temperature goes to T. And this goal starts from some temperature T0. We will have two choices. Uh, choice number one would be saying that Cp is uh, nearly constant uh, in the temperature range T naught to T. If that is the case, then S of T will be equal to S naught plus Cp times integral T naught to T dT over T, which will be S naught plus Cp times log T over T naught. All right? As simple as that. Um, so what chemists do actually is to, in some situations, um, find heat capacities of substances. Suppose they take um, carbon dioxide. I'm just, that comes to my mind. They take carbon dioxide gas and, cal and measure its heat capacity. And um, um, for that heat capacity, they put that value over here, take this to be equal to zero, and they get from this log the value of entropy that they want, that, uh, for, 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 for carbon dioxide. Uh, at a temperature T of their choice, when they take uh, T naught to be some value at which they take S naught to be equal to zero. Or if they know S naught at T naught, then certainly they will use that T naught and that value of S naught to get the value of S at temperature T. This is the standard practice. The second choice for them is to, for some reason, for, 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 for through a large number of experiments, um, find a T dependence of Cp, um, either theoretically or experimentally, um, or theoretically. Theoretically, you can actually find Cp um, if you do uh, statistical mechanics. Using a statistical mechanical method you can find this for example for example if you are to um, uh, look at um, solids then you can do um, 
statistical mechanics of solids and find that C, well actually I know for CV but CV and CP are nearly the same, is equal to A times T plus gamma times T cubed. If you, if you, uh, when you get to study the physics of solids or chemistry of solids, you will do statistical mechanics, use statistical mechanics and you can calculate this and why these two terms? Uh, they are contributions from two different degrees of freedom. Uh, this is from uh, electrons. in solids and this is from ions in solids. Ions sit in their respective positions and over there they vibrate, they oscillate. And it is this motion, oscillatory motion of ions that you get a T cubed type contribution and electrons are completely free to go about in solids and because they are completely free to go about their contribution is proportional to T only. And A is known for each solid and gamma is known for each solid. You can do experiment, find them experimentally and therefore you actually know the temperature dependence of C. And if you know the temperature dependence of C then you can actually then calculate ST. You can say that S of T is oops I always forget. Hmm? Uh, S of T is S0 plus. Now I will have to go back to the integral over here. I can't take CP out. I will have to go to integral and I will say it is from T0 to T of uh, Cp over T will be A plus gamma T squared dt and therefore this is equal to S naught plus A times T minus T naught. Is it okay? I'm sorry? So aren't you using Cv over there? CP, okay, I am, uh, uh, if I am using CV or CP, okay, as I said, uh, this could be, I could, CP is very closely e equal to this, it is plus uh, something called, uh, plus a constant B, because CP and CV have to be different by a small amount, okay. So this is a constant B and that constant B might lead to an additional uh, okay, if you like, I can actually then have, uh, if there is that B floating also, then I will have B over T plus A plus gamma T squared. And therefore, I will have B times integral of 1 over t dt over t is log t so this will be um, okay let me write down fully b times uh, integral uh, dt over t from t naught to t and then plus a <coughs> integral dt t naught to t and then plus gamma integral t squared dt T naught to T and therefore I will have this equal to S naught plus B times log of T over T naught plus A times T minus T naught plus gamma over 3 times T cubed minus T naught cubed. This will be the, this will be the uh, value of entropy. And if you know T naught and S naught, and we know B and A and gamma, 
we can calculate the value of S and call it absolute entropy. Okay? This is what will happen in chemistry. In chemistry, you will have calculate, you will calculate absolute values of entropy. And that absolute value of entropy will follow a method something like this. Um, yeah, I've done this. Let me take an example. In this example, I um, would like to, where is this example? In this example, I would like to take uh, some material, um, water, and I would take H2O I'm just trying to see. Um, and H2O starting from um, initially, where am I? I did not bring some, oh, I have this sheet over here. Okay, good. Um, I would like to take uh, this at um, a very low temperature, you know, this ice which is um, at um, T naught equal to 10 degree Kelvin, very low, okay, minus 263 um, centigrade. And I will Take it to a steam at um, final temperature equal to 110 degrees centigrade, which is uh, 383 Kelvin. So from 10K to 383 Kelvin. And the idea is to basically uh, see if I can calculate, um, find change in entropy. And uh, uh, this is something that um, is supposed to be a very important part of the exercises that do in chemistry. They need to find uh, entropy changes because that gives, tells them a great deal about how the reaction is taking place. Um, what would they need to do? You know that this is, uh, it essentially is uh, 10K, at 10K, it is ice. Um, at uh, 273K, it melts. And uh, then beyond that, it is uh, liquid up to 373K where it boils. And then after that, up to 383. Did I? Just, yeah, okay. Um, I'm sorry. 100 degrees, yes, okay. 373, yes, good. Um, it is um, uh, it, it is steam in this process, and the heat capacities are different in these states when the system is a solid or a liquid or a gas. And not only that, but also there is this melting and there is this boiling which is taking place. Change of state is taking place. And this boiling and melting is uh, to be seen in, you know, this, this change of state, phase transition, as it is called. Melting and boiling, yeah. Sorry? Uh, can we go beyond 383? Sure, 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 you can. 
no problem. हाँ ये तो मैंने वैसी मिसाल ले ली सिर्फ यहाँ पे हालांकि टेन you will have a steam that you can heat up to maybe a thousand degrees centigrade. You will always do that, you know, because uh, these the, the, the huge uh, turbines that you run in large um, power plants are with superheated steams, which uh, are at very high pressures and at these uh, uh, high temperatures like 1000 degrees or 600 degrees centigrade. So uh, here you have, therefore, this uh, phase transitions. And in phase transitions, what happens in phase transitions is that uh, phase transitions, like you all know, that if you if if uh, your uh, if water is water when water evaporates, um, there is this large change in volume at exactly the same temperature. So as you heat up the water from zero degrees or lower degrees. It, water gets more and more, uh, gets to a higher and higher temperature. When it comes to 100 degrees centigrade, it will, at, in normal atmosphere, it will, uh, th th there will be no further change in temperature, and it will change its state, and all the heat that you put, get, give to it will go into um, changing the state of the system. This is the phase transition. Okay? This is a normal observation we all know uh, in this thing. So, um, at phase transition, um, there is um, large volume change as well as a change in entropy, a large change in entropy. All that heat that goes into this, um, which turns water into steam, a liquid into gas, increases a lot of randomness in the system and therefore increases the entropy of the system. And that increase in entropy is uh, um, given by um, uh, enthalpy change because it takes place at constant temperature and constant pressure. Enthalpy change divided by T. So at these two points, at the point of melting, at the point of boiling, your changes in entropy are going to be given by the changes in enthalpy um, of that particular kind. There will be different values of change in enthalpy at these two different points. And these will be, for example, if I were to write this as uh, um, uh, for melting, I will have melting here, and this melting will take place at uh, what is called uh, melting temperature. And similarly, I would have delta S boiling e evaporation will be delta H evaporation boiling divided by the boiling temperature. The temperature values will be different, the entropy and enthalpy changes will be different, and therefore the entropies will be different. Um, in the case of uh, water, for example, um, latent heat of fusion melting is uh, uh, equal to uh, 6 kilojoules um, per mole and uh, melting temperature uh, is uh, 273. Um, similarly, latent heat of... Uh, um, if this is so, then entropy change is equal to the latent heat of fusion. This quantity, change in enthalpy, is, the, is what we call latent heat. This is the heat which disappears into the system. It doesn't show as increase in temperature. And system changes the state. So this is called latent heat. So this latent heat uh, for at the, uh, uh, when, when, um, uh, the, when ice melts, this is uh, the change in entropy is uh, six kilojoules, 6,000 joules divided by 
273 Kelvin temperature, um, and that is uh, 22 joules um, per Kelvin um, per mole. If you were to look at the uh, vaporization, of water, then latent heat of vaporization is is uh, is is uh, forty point six uh, kilojoules per mole. You see, latent heat of vaporization is much much larger than latent heat of uh, melting, and uh, that is what makes our life so easy because then we can do a lot of cooling by evaporation is because of this. Um, and this happens at uh, 373 degrees, so delta S, and I'll put over here uh, melting and over here evaporation or boiling. This is equal to uh, 40.6 times 10 to the power 3 divided by the temp temperature is 273 plus 100, so 373, and that uh, is uh, uh, 109 Joule uh, per Kelvin per mole. So, um, change in entropy is very large with the boiling um, when they want, when, when for in evaporation and uh, much smaller in the case of melting. All right. <clears throat> okay. So the point what he's asking is, why didn't you write the usual delta S equal to delta Q over T? We could do that, but since we know that at constant pressures, uh, all the heat that goes in actually goes into increasing enthalpy. So enthalpy becomes the measure. And we actually calculate, in chemistry, since everything happens at constant uh, um, pressure, so rather than measuring internal energy, uh, uh, in chemical reactions they measure change in enthalpy. And that we should keep in mind, because that becomes, uh, that, that is the um, uh, important difference uh, in doing chemical thermodynamics. The next point is that I would like to uh, then use some numbers for uh, this exercise that I said. And I is taken at 10 degree Kelvin and taken to this and it goes through these steps, all of these steps. So the, 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 the portions are number one, heating ice from 10 Kelvin to um, 273 Kelvin melting of ice and then uh, heating of water from 273 to 373 and then evaporation and then lastly uh, heating steam from 373 to what is the final temperature? 383. This is, this is what we need to work out. And in the first case, in the, in the second and fourth cases, we have already evaluated delta S. Now we need to actually do 
1, 3 and 5. And in the case of 1, 3 and 5, we will use uh, heat capacities and the formula that I uh, wrote over here. If you know the functional dependence of Cp on temperature, we will use it inside. If you don't, we will simply um, take it constant and take it outside. So we will actually have delta S being given by, or S uh, as I have been saying, S at T being equal to S naught plus something. And plus then you have some initial temperature 10K to um, 273K of, uh, this is heating up, so this is Cp of, in, when water is in the crystalline form, divided by temperature dt, this will be the step one. Step two we have already calculated, plus delta Sm, plus get come to state is 3. In the case of 3 we will have um, 273 to 373 Cp of water liquid. In the liquid state divided by T dt and then we will have number 4 that we have over here delta S boiling and then lastly we will have 373 uh, to 383 Cp if you know the value of the gaseous phase divided by T dt. Alright so uh, usually when I looked up the tables somewhere, I found that Cp crystal, crystalline phase, is uh, 38 um, joule per Kelvin per mole. Cp um, uh, water liquid hmm? kya baat hai ho rahi hai koi samajh bhi nahi aa raha okay cp liquid is uh, um, 4.2 joule per kelvin per mole cp um, what was it? Steam or gas is uh, 37 joule per Kelvin per mole. When I put all of these values and I take these heat capacities to be constant, I will take them to be constant. I don't know their uh, dependence on temperature except that for the case of crystal I should have been actually using this relationship for heat capacity. Uh, but if I take them all constant and I put them in um, I do the integrations then I will end up with value which will give me all of this put together delta S I'm not going to go through all the numbers given over here um, equal to 324 uh, joule per Kelvin per mole and as 
chemists we will call this change in entropy to be measured to have been measured from a reference point s not which we will take to be zero and hence because that was actually a pretty low temperature it was 10 degree kelvin very low so we will actually call it absolute value of entropy so this is equal to s h 2 o at t equal to um, 383 kelvin rather than delta s we will call it this this is important you know they do not then would uh, consider that to be the difference they will take that value to be the uh, reference value and take that to be equal to zero and from there this value would be given to H2O molecule and the um, molar uh, entropy um, at 383 degree Kelvin would be given in this manner. Now similarly uh, there's no point in doing this exercise, but then I can bring you to, um, if suppose this is given at a particular temperature, this was evaluated, this entropy was evaluated at one temperature, so absolute entropy, usually what they do is they put a small um, zero on top of as a superscript over here, this is what I have seen in textbooks. As a superscript over here to say that this is the absolute value of entropy. Um, of H2O at 383 Kelvin was equal to 324 Joule per Kelvin per mole. So this is absolute molar uh, entropy of H2O at this temperature. Suppose you, they know this for um, a, a, at a given um, uh, temperature, can one find um, this entropy at another temperature? Again, um, starting from the same expression that we used over here, ST minus S naught equal to this, 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 this quantity, one can, um, uh, if you want to calculate to find S naught at a different temperature, say 400 Kelvin. What you would do is to use the same expression, you will say S400 is equal to S383 minus or plus integral 383 to 400 CP over T, TT. And if you regard CP to be constant, and uh, Um, in this range of temperature, which is only about 17 degrees, will hardly change. So you can then calculate this as Cp times log of 400 divided by 383. And you can put in the value of Cp as the value in the case of steam, which is 37 joules per Kelvin per mole and put that in here and get the value for higher temperature. So what is the usual practice in the case of um, in chemical thermodynamics, thermodynamics done in chemistry? You have thick books which people have prepared which are tables of entropies which will be 
the entropies that would include all the information that has been obtained from experiments, like heat capacities and other constants, and then such evaluations so that entropies of different chemical substances, which are of course thousands and thousands, if not millions, all of those substances at different values of temperature are essentially tabulated. Now, if you have, suppose, um, entropies given here um, for a particular substance, you have entropies given at, say, five points. Right? If they're given at five points, one can actually do an extrapolation This is called interpolation. And you can actually try and find the values in between at the points in between these given points. And if you do this, the procedure is called interpolation. There are standard practices, standard ways of doing the interpolation. When you do the interpolation, you get a mathematical relationship, algebraic relationship. This algebraic relation will be the interpolation formula. And this interpolation formula, interpolation formula would read something like um, the following. It will read like S as a function of T is equal to A plus B times T plus C times T cubed plus D times T to the power 4, etc., etc. And um, if you know a formula like this, then you can actually then work out the value of entropy at any given temperature through because of this interpolation mechanism. Uh, so this is how um, these things are done in chemistry. I have spared you with a large number of examples. नहीं आनी चाहिए। आह, interpolation is uh, something which I could I could add a square term or maybe that doesn't really exist. Uh, interpolation is something which uh, the highest power would depend upon how many data points you have. So if you have five data points you cannot have an interpolation formula more than 4 to the power 4. This is the basic uh, law of uh, interpolation, uh, principle of inter interpolation. The it will not be more than 4. So it depends upon how many points you have. And it, would, it, it can be that um, the interpolation will give you a straight line because all the points are a straight line, you have five points, and all five points lie on a straight line, then that will be simply um, a relationship like this, where nothing else will exist. So some coefficients may exist, some coefficient may become zero. That is always possible. OK, so um, is this the end of today's lecture? Yes. Okay, this is the end of today's lecture. <laughs>